Good morning. I am not a pony, but I am a little horse this morning. I can tell you a story about a pony sometime, but this is not the time to do it. We had uh, wonderful people to fill in in my absence, both when I was in Tennessee and then uh, two Sundays not feeling well if any this COVID has given me a little heart of sympathy for people who've had it because we had never had it before and I know I've talked to people that had it a whole lot worse and and so we're thankful that things are no worse than they are I'm trying not to talk too loudly if you can't hear me let me know we have got to page 49 in our book with my study, and I want to add a scripture before we look at um, the scriptures that Brother May has given us. 
For those who are watching online, welcome to our class on the divine providence of God. The section that we're studying in our book from Brother Cecil May on providence is God knows what we need. I want to do this too. I, I gave everyone a copy of this this song. It's a song that was written by, uh, well, you can see the names at the bottom. I don't remember the tune. I heard it on the internet, but I, I do like the, the lyrics. And I thought this went very well with our study on providence and God knowing what we need. So the, the, the line goes, the title is Peace in Trusting. Uh, God only knows how I've cried, heartbroken, and my hands are tied. He's been faithful time and time again, and although I don't know how it ends, there's peace in trusting the Lord. Peace when my faith and fear are at war, so I don't have to worry. He knows what's in store, and there's peace in trusting the Lord. There's peace in trusting the Lord. If his will should not go my way, if the answer is not what I pray, then I'll trust him for what I can't see because I know he knows what's best for me. There's peace in trusting the Lord when my faith and fear are at war so I don't have to worry. He knows what's in store. And there's peace in trusting the Lord. There's peace and peace, peace in trusting the Lord. I thought you would enjoy and appreciate that when you think about providence, and I think about it, even before we started the study, I thought about providing something uh, for someone else or being a recipient of something provided by someone else. One of the characteristics of God is that he is providential. Paul would tell the, the Athenians and all those gathered on Mars Hill when he preached in Acts 17 that it's in him we live and move and have our being. We are alive because God is and he's made us. The Apostle Paul is a man that I admire more, just about more than any other in certain ways in, in all the New Testament other than Jesus. And I have great respect for Peter and how he grew and, and others. But the Lord provided Paul for us to learn so many things. And in, we're in Philippians chapter 1. If you want to note that in your, uh, in your book there, I want to look at verse uh, 19. Paul is in prison. He's really not sure if he's going to live or die. He doesn't know. He knows that a lot of people put in the Roman prisons did not ever come out. Not alive anyway. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of of the spirit of Jesus Christ. I'll go on into verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So he talks about, I want to throw this out. If you ever know of Christians in any place be they in our own town, community, congregation, another state, somewhere else in the world, who are really struggling because of their service to God. And there are people in this congregation that are struggling with it. I know. The prayers for those people are powerful. Paul said, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. Don't ever discount the value of prayer. You can't put your hands on somebody to help them. You may not be able 
I mean, Paul's in prison. You just couldn't walk in there and do something for him. But you can go to the one who can. And I just wanted to bring that out because one of the things that I've learned from Paul, it didn't matter what happened in his life. He trusted God. If I don't get anything else out of the study of providence, then the fact that no matter what happens, God is faithful. He's trustworthy. And he's not going anywhere. Where. He's there for us. He's there for the hurting. He's there for the questioners, just like you and like me. So I wanted to put that in there just as a note um, and understand the context. Um, something else that I wanted to bring out here while we're there about something providential. The Philippians knew that Paul was in prison. That kind of word will get around for sure. And obviously they were concerned about it. It's natural. But I want you to look at verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Wait a minute, you're in prison, Paul. Yes. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the Praetorian Guard. Now those are the people that guarded prisoners for the Roman government. They know about, they know why I'm here. And, and obviously he wasn't complaining about what being there and it was known to everyone else and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment Prisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Do you see some providence there, Steve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, well, but Paul's in dire circumstances. He may be, but it didn't stop him from his purpose because the reason he went in there to start with was because he was sharing the gospel with people. And the Jews had him put in jail. Yes, sir. So it makes you think of the verse, uh, all things work together for the good for them that love the Lord. That's how this is working. And, and Paul wrote that, did he not, in Romans 8, 28. And just think, he knew that personally. It wasn't just a good quote-unquote philosophy. He knew that, did he? <laughs> so just, just think now uh, how that, Circumstances that look bleak or bad or terrible to us can turn out to be beneficial for the cause of Christ. It depends on what we do with our circumstances. Um, I've said this a few minutes ago. I'll say it again. Having COVID has caused me to have more sympathy for others who have had it. And I'm not over it. I'm not contagious, but it's still working. Yesterday, Elise and I were just busy as bees around the house, and this morning I didn't want to get out of bed, but I did. I'm glad I did. But I don't have sympathy for people who've had cancer like I do this. I don't know, but if you've had cancer, you can relate to it. Or maybe someone real close to you uh, has had it. So, you know, it... Can, can our, Paul talked about the, the thorn in the flesh here. Um, when God gave him the answer, how did Paul react? He prayed a few times, but he still, still wanted it fixed, if you will, but he accepted it. <laughs> yes, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, where he talks about this thorn in the flesh. Now, I'm going to have to plead ignorance here on what he meant by praying about it three times because I think I'd have prayed about it more than that. <laughs> but I, I don't know exactly why it was just three times, but maybe Paul went very seriously, deeply to God three times about it. How many, you know, maybe how many times did Jesus go 
away and pray in the garden three times. And, and so we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, and I don't know that we gain anything by trying to figure it out. If God wanted us to know, he would have told us. Paul knew what it was, and God knew. And God wouldn't take it away. Now, uh, since I said that I'm trying to conserve my voice, uh, Tony, would you read uh, verses 7 and 8 in First Corinthians? How about, yeah, verses 7 and 8? Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, <clears throat> to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implore the Lord three times that it might leave me. And what did uh, he write in verse 9? Mike? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, verse 9, Mike. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What an attitude. What an attitude. What if, what if Paul was, was going blind? I believe it was his letter to the churches of Galatia. He said, You see with what large letters... He wasn't talking about the length of the letter. He's talking about the size of the letters. How many of y'all need larger letters than you used to? You know, I was looking at one of my old Bibles the other day. I said, I can't preach out of this one. It's just too small. But we, that could have been it. Did miraculous healing take place during this time, Sister Sam? Yeah. God didn't heal this. There are some things God will leave as they are. But what did Paul call this? A messenger of? So that's an inspired statement that things like that come from the devil, not from God. God allows it. The bad things that happened to Job came from the devil. But God allowed it. Interestingly, uh, Job, uh, the devil needed permission. I guarantee you God does not let the devil do whatever he wants to do. But he does enough. So how do I take this, okay? Let's say that I'm 45 years old. Brenda and I were talking about where I was. How you know, we used to smoke and they, doctors have said well sometimes that'll catch up with you even later even though it may have been years so what if all of a sudden I had lung cancer because of something that I stopped doing many years ago well, Lord I'm let's say I'm 45 and I asked the Lord to, to heal it and he says no but Lord I want to serve you till I'm 85 he may say no. Is it all right to accept God's no? Yeah. He, he has a reason for his answers. Why did, uh, why do some people live much longer? I don't know. Why do some people smoke for years and live into their 90s? I don't know. But whatever this was, what was sufficient What's sufficient? Grace. God's grace. Brother May pointed out something that I have thought about. I always appreciate men who know more than I do or have studied something more. We don't know what that grace was. It could have been saving grace, couldn't it? Look at some of the comments that Brother May made about it. I thought he made some good points. Um, Steve, if you would read that bottom paragraph on page 49 where it says after three fervent requests after three fervent requests to have his infirmary removed Paul said that God answered him with these words my grace is sufficient for you there is no much speculation about what Paul's thorn in the flesh may have been many think they can build a strong case for a particular answer 
answer, but no one knows for sure. Similarly, we do not know what the grace was that God gave Paul instead of removing the thorn. This could have been the grace that brings salvation. Paul often rejoiced in that grace. Paul also considered his ministry, his apostleship to the Gentiles, a gift of grace. Or this grace could have been some other favor specifically granted in lieu of removing the thorn. Go ahead and read that. Whatever it was, God said that it was enough, sufficient. Paul, in effect, said he would rather continue to have the thorn than forego the favor God had given him. From this episode in Paul's life, we learned that God sometimes does not do exactly as we have asked him, ask because he knows things we do not know. What we ask may be more harmful than beneficial. Let's read that again. What? What we do not know, what we ask may be more harmful than beneficial. Now, that statement is critical because we do not know more than God. Now, we might understand that until we get into trouble. Then we think we know more than God. We may not say that, but it's like, well, God, I would, I, I want you to fix this. And he, and it's like, okay. Are you going to tell me what to do? You know, I'm not a computer that you type a, type a document into and then it prints. That's not the way this works. Yes, sir. Don't, don't we as parents have to say no sometimes to children and they might not necessarily understand why it's better for them? <laughs> so certainly, God's ways are higher than ours. How many of you have prayed for something to change and it didn't and you were okay with it anyway we are selfish agreed we are inherently selfish all of us and we, we don't probably don't notice it till we start thinking about things like this but um, when it comes to our needs and dependence on God, we can't be self. We can't be self-centered. We need to be God-centered. And if He knows what's best for us, and we pray the fervent prayer that we read about in James five sixteen, that avails much. Once you give it to God, whatever the answer is, we need to accept it because God's not a puppet. Some people think he's a puppet. Well, I, this is what I want you to do for me. You know, wait a minute. We're not, God's not a puppeteer, but he's not a puppet either. He's God. And let's look back here uh, in this earlier section uh, where, uh, at least if you would, on page 49, it said, sometimes we ask for what? Sometimes what we ask for is not really what we need. Now, if you would read that paragraph. Sometimes what we ask for is not really what we need. Jesus said, which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, will give him a stone? In Jesus' day, bread was often made from little round balls of dough, which were cooked in a hole in the ground in which a fire was laid, stones were added. The stones were made hot by the fire, and the heat from the stones would then cook the bread. As the delicious hot bread was being taken up for eating, a child might see one of the hot stones and mistaking it for bread point to it eagerly. I want that big one, Daddy. The father, older and wiser, knowing what the child was asking for was not really what he wanted, would withhold the stone and supply the so the next time you read uh, Matthew 7, uh, in particular verse 9, which one of you, if his son asked for bread, will give him a stone, you get an idea why Jesus used that illustration. And for years, I had no idea what he was talking about. Now I understand. How many of you have ever cooked potatoes in a fire in the ground? No? We, we used to do that in Tennessee, and we put hot rocks in. You don't have any rocks here. Uh, you'd have to go up there and do it. <laughs> you put rocks in the ground, they get hot, 
And because that, and you put, you can put a potato in there, you, and it'll bake. Boy, it's good. Well, you want the potato or the stone? Well, Jesus said God's not going to give you the stone. He's going to give you the bread. And so, I think the hardest part in what we're talking about, brothers and sisters, and any watching on the internet is realizing number one not theoretically but re realistically that God does know what's best for us he made us he made my mind my eyes my body my spirit he made me surely when it comes to my needs he knows what I need more than I do and that's the that's the sad thing about people in our society who think they don't need God. They think they can do it themselves. No wonder they don't want to talk to anybody. They don't care about anybody else. So I need to realize when I pray, this is not in the book, but I'm going to look at it. Look at 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. We knew a an elder when we were in Tennessee 21 years ago, and he he would take me out for breakfast, and, I, and he and I remember that, and uh, he died the other day. He had dementia. I said we need to call his wife, talk to him. She talked to us for over an hour. And she did most of the talk. Yeah, she did. She and did and she said a lot of things. And, and, and I think if you live with someone with dementia a lot by yourself, you don't have <clears throat> conversations with those people. And so who do you turn to? Well, you turn to friends. I'm glad we called her. You know, they, they were kind and benevolent to us. But... When there's no person to talk to. Uh, Brenda, would you read 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Okay. Now, care, my translation says anxiety, but what does Peter tell us to do with our cares, our anxieties. What do you do with them? How many of them? All of them. Ooh. Is that hard yeah. sometimes? God gives us these things as a challenge, doesn't he, Sammy? Because it's hard sometimes to do that. To lay it before God and walk off. It's okay, there it is. No, we're going to go sit on the front porch or, or our favorite chair or whatever. We're going, to, we're going to worry about it sometimes. And I think Jesus told us not to worry about material things. Peter says, and Paul too, uh, don't be anxious for anything. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. I mean, don't be anxious for anything. And I think, what does anxiety do for your stomach sometimes, Linda? It'll make you kind of sick, won't it? Yes. I was talking to my dad one time about my stomach, and he said, what are you worrying about? I said, nothing. He said, are you sure? After I thought about it, I, I've been worried about things. Mm -hmm. So, but this is, this is more than a, an upset stomach. We either trust God implicitly or we don't trust him at all. And that's the hard part. We want other people to. Why do? How well do we do with it? Go ahead, Steve. I was just saying that this verse, he started off by saying, humble yourselves before God. That, that includes the amount of trust, I think. When you humble yourself before God, Lord, I, I'm nothing. I can't handle this. But you're here. James said, humble yourself. 
So when you when life troubles you, every, and I I do listen to people. You want to learn what's going on with them? Keep your mouth shut and your ears open. They'll tell you. They may not intend to, but they will. And, and so I know what some people are struggling with because they've said so. And so I think, okay, that person needs to do what? They're Christian. Give it to God. Now, if your son asks for a stone, I mean, a piece of bread, or if you ask God for a piece of bread, or you ask for help with a certain thing that's troubling you, what's God going to give you? The right thing. The right thing. And do you think Brother May's statement is valid? Sometimes what we ask for is not what we really need. I mean, let's face it. Okay, so, well, I'm 60-some-odd years old, or I'm 70-some-odd years old, or I'm 50 years old, and I know what's best for me. No, you don't. Neither do I. Unless I read it in the Word of God, which tells me what's best. Now, there are two ways to find out what's best. The first one is, is get in the Scripture and see what God wants from us. I mean, is it Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good, but what does the Lord require of you but to do good, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? That kind of sums up how we ought to live. You brought it up. Good observation, the text. Humble yourselves. Get off your throne. Get off your, your special place and get on your knees at least spiritually before God and ask him to help you with this and and all of your anxiety not just this mm -hmm. but everything that's bothering you and and I want you to look at verse the latter part uh, of verse 5 God is opposed to what but gives grace to so then you have the therefore in verse 6. Therefore. What's it there for? <laughs> to tell you what I'm talking about. Humble yourselves under what kind of hand? Mighty, 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 hand. mighty hand of God. God's not only not a pop puppet. He's not weak either. Who parted the Red Sea? Somebody says Moses did. No, he didn't. <laughs> Moses was there. God did it, didn't he, Steve? Who worked all those miracles in Egypt when Moses was there? Was Moses an agent? But yeah, but who worked the miracles? God did. Did you know that Jesus did not work miracles without the Holy Spirit? So my point is, God has the power to help us, and he's not working miracles, but he does provide what I need if I trust him. What if I don't trust him, Linda? What does James tell us about that? The first part of the cha first chapter, chapter one. If you don't, trust you don't, you don't get what you're. That's right. I mean, you've got to have faith. Yeah. It, Asking faith, nothing wavering. He said, "Don't expect to receive anything from the Lord." And he might give it, but don't expect it. And I think we talk about faith. We talk about trust. Um, I've used this before and I'm sure that you understand when we come up what's called Old Valdosta Road at one point it's Cat Creek and then the county line it changes and back over here and then whatever this road is what's the number 37. 37. So we turn left on 37. Well, 37 goes all the way into Nashville. Uh, well, Ray City does it if you stay on it. All right. Do you think that if I am come to that stop sign and Elisa's in the car, or, it, you know, let's just say, and that I'm not going to look to the right and see if anybody's coming? I'll ask her. And you know what? When she says it's okay, I don't look. I trust her. Because she has good vision. There's nothing wrong with her mind. 
and I trust her answer, and I'll look to the left. I need to look to the left twice, because one day I didn't look good, and I almost pulled out. Front. I did pull out in front of somebody, and it was too close for comfort. But my point is, how much do we trust God over a passenger in the car with good mind and good vision when it comes to life's hard questions? God's providence works, but it works more when we trust Him. I don't know what God will do for me if I don't talk to him. I don't know that he's going to do much more than he would for an alien sinner. Yes, sir? To your point about not knowing specifically what's best for us what God does, again, we, we think on those things, even if we're trying to be spiritually minded, we have a worldly perspective, and the Bible tells us we're here to glorify God. So what's best? It, it might not it just might not fit that frame of, that we see of, of, okay, I need to see about me. Whereas God says, I'm, I'm here to glorify Him. That's the heart. You know, I know I quote Luke 9 23 a lot, but it's still, He said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's the hardest verse in the world to put into practice. It's easy to memorize. That's what's in the way of conversion. Right? Well, and it might be in my way of acting and not getting wrapped up in what I'd rather be doing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Because in the James it says, if we pray and don't receive, we might be praying and asking amiss. Was that praying for the... Yes, it was. Satisfy our love. In uh, James chapter 4. Yeah. Um... Look at look at James four, one through three. Linda, if you would just read that for us. You brought it out. Good observation. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. In other words, you're praying selfish prayers. God, this is what I want. I want you to do this for me. I had, uh, on the, when, when I got ready to leave Gatlinburg, before I left home, I went to start my truck. Because they said it was helping me get out the door and she couldn't wait for me to leave. No, I'll, but seriously, uh, my truck wouldn't start. Well, it wouldn't start. It wouldn't jump off from her car. So I take the battery out and we take it down to advance auto parts. That battery's six years old. Well, it's time for it to die. Got a new battery. Oh, if you hadn't bought one lately, you better be saving it up in your piggy bank. So anyway, $250 later, I got a new battery. It starts right up. Put me, what, 40, 50 minutes behind, and I thought, well, at least I wasn't at a rest area when this happened. I'd have had to hire a tow truck. Drove to, to uh, Sevierville. Oh, it was beautiful. We went through, I went through northeast Georgia, North Carolina, Cherokee, went over through the National. If you ever go to Gatlinburg, go that way. You don't go through Knoxville. But uh, then I go on down to Sevierville and spend the week at polishing the pulpit and everything was fine. Truck started every time. I got ready to leave uh, Thursday morning. She started right up. I went back the way I was coming that I came and I started in the National Forest and that truck quit on me. You got this little tow button. Some of them I said, let's just see what it'll do. I shouldn't have touched it, but it shouldn't have messed it up either. Well, it did. I had to pull over. No phone. No, there's no signal in a national forest. I can't text. I can't call. And I thought, surely somebody will stop. Well, I waved this guy down in a van, and he pulled over, and we talked, and he was by himself. He just kind of traveling around, you know. And He said, well, he had one of these jump stars. 
said, well, let's see if it'll start first. Well, it finally did, but it, it just didn't act right. The lights weren't on for the transmission selector, and I drove all the way to Gatlinburg downhill, and the transmission has a, thermal, has a gauge on it, no reading. And then I get down there and it doesn't want to start. So I parked behind a, a barbecue place that I had eaten in when I went in on, uh, before I went there. And I went and talked to the owner. I said, uh, my truck won't start. I'm going to have to leave. That's fine. That's fine. So anyway, that man stayed with me until I got a hold of somebody that could take me home. You call it what you want to. It was providential. Did God make it happen? I don't know. All I know is that this man cared enough about my situation that uh, that he stayed with me until, and I had called the Ford dealer in Sevierville. Uh, well, that's probably the lead frame, and we don't have any, and if we did, we don't have a transmission man that could fix it. So I thought, well, that's great. So I called a tow truck in Valdosta, $2,600, come up there and get it, bring it down here. I said, no, no, I'll sell it. <laughs> but anyway, Dylan Guthrie was up there. I texted him, I told him what was going on. He said, I'll go to you all and get a dolly and we'll take it home. He had a 2500 Dodge that he, and so no problem. So he and Wes Hazel and I rode back. Now I'm gonna call it Providential. I don't know how God works, but I'm going to give him the glory because $200 for a dolly or whatever it was, a lot better than $2,600. But I'm going to share this with you. I'm not boasting. That man stayed with me. His name was Lester. I don't know his last name. And I said, Lester, do you read much? He said, no, not a whole lot. I said, well, I've got something I think you'll read. He said, really? I said, yeah. I, I told him about transformed. I gave him a copy. I put my name and phone number in there. I said, you believe in God? He said, yeah. And I said, well, some people don't, you know. And he said, oh, I do. And he thanked me for it. And he, you know. So providence has its way of working unless we sit down and do nothing. Right? Now, my truck's at Langdale Ford. When will I get it back? I don't know. They don't have the part. If it's what I need, they don't have it. And they don't know when they're going to get it. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to let him provide. Because I'm not about to go out and spend more money on another truck when this one will be perfectly fine if they can fix this. So, I have put it in God's hands. I am not going to worry about it because Jesus told me not to. Right? Sister Sammy had her trouble with her car. Was she taken care of? Yeah. Give God the glory. Now, on this, we got about two minutes here. God's answer is always what? Better. Jesus prayed fervently. Fervently. This is the Son of God. This is God in human flesh. Pray, prayed fervently three times in the garden that the Lord, his Father, would remove the cup from him. Did the Father remove it? What was Jesus' answer? Your will be done. Yeah, nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. And I'm thinking, that's what I need to get out of this section of this study, is accepting God's answer. And uh, if... And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for people like Lester because there aren't many people that'll stop anymore. Maybe he saw that Jesus tag on the front of my truck. I don't know, but I don't think he did. He saw me waving. <laughs> Help. But he stopped. You know, it could have been late at night, in the mountains, raining, in the track, when you could have been in I'm going to say this. However you want to view it, God took care of it because he, he has put something in people that causes them to care about other people. It's up to them what they do with it.
Pray for Lester. Maybe he'll become a Christian.